everyone. Thanks for coming along today. What we're going to be doing is talking about residential conveyancing problems. And on my travels up and down the countryside recently, and on the webinars that I've been delivering recently and looking at LinkedIn, the issue of the Building Safety Act is sort of a, a nightmare for every conveyancer that's dealing with leasehold work. So what I want to do today is to uh, jog through a number of issues and problems associated with the Building Safety Act, with regard to fire regulations, with regard to lenders, and what we can do at the moment. Um, and to be honest with you, I really am sort of sorry for conveyances at the moment that are doing leasehold work in connection with high-rise buildings, because there are a number of nightmares arising and that will continue to arise until we seek some form of clarification. Almost on a daily basis, I look at the Law Society website, I look at the Leasehold Advisory Service website, and also the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership website to see if there's anything there that can really enable us to sort of drill down and see what we can do and what we ought to do. And at this moment in time, unfortunately, all I can do is extract bits of information from various sources, including the primary and secondary legislation, uh, identify where there are problems, and to be honest with you, there aren't many solutions. All I can do is highlight the problems and highlight what I think is a very defensive position to take with regard to leasehold transactions involving high-rise buildings. So, first things first, useful websites. The Leasehold Advisory Service has some information about high-rise buildings and the Building Safety Act. The uh, Association of Residential Managing Agents has some useful information about both and also about landlords inquiries. Um, as I say, Property Law UK, we're doing something in February featuring this topic as a sort of major issue. Uh, the PLA hasn't got anything on it as yet. The RICS has some guidance for surveyors uh, relating to fire safety issues, and there is a standard there that I refer to in the notes that we might touch on as we progress. But to be honest with you, there's very little sort of definitive guides that are available for practitioners. There are, however, uh, information leaflets available to leaseholders, responsible persons, landlords, etc., that provide some assistance for them, but not a lot of assistance for you and I. So, first of all, problems. The Building Safety Act is an interesting piece of legislation, in my mind, sort of created in panic, really, with a good guard to Grenfell and getting something out there. And it creates all sorts of issues, you know, the building safety regulator, the empowerment of the regulator. And the most, first problem with the Gartley Act is what's in force. It's not all in force as yet. Some of it is, some of it isn't. So there's an issue with regard to the Building Safety Act, how it works, how it operates and uh, how it applies with regard to fire safety issues. It is the Building Safety Act. It's not an act purely and simply focusing in on fire safety, although fire safety is an issue. Then we've got landlord certificates and leaseholders um, deed of certificates. And the problem there is from a conveyancing perspective, can a seller obtain them? And if the seller obtains them, what sort of advice, what sort of explanation, what sort of assistance should the conveyance of the seller be providing to the client? Is it similar to the situation with regard to TA forms that the client completes the deed of certificate by like way of self-declaration, as it were, and all we do is check that the information appears to be consistent with the information on our file, or just what do we do? And with regard to landlord certificates, are landlords producing them? Do landlords understand and appreciate what is necessary to be contained in the certificate and the ancillary information that needs to be produced alongside? So there are issues. And then we've got fire safety regulations, a raft starting with the 2005 regulations, 2022 re regulations, some of which have just come into force on the 23rd of January this year. Again, what's our role with regard to those regulations? If we have a landlord or a responsible person as defined by the regulations failing to comply, is that going to invalidate insurance and cause problems or issues, as well as the practical issue and practical problem of fire safety risk to our clients life and limb. We're not finished with regard to problems. <laughs> lenders instructions. How on earth can we comply with some of the lenders instructions that we're seeing at the moment? What do we do? Um, has the law society had a quiet or indeed a loud word with lenders to say, look, you know, what you're proposing, what you're requiring of conveyances is unfair. 
Should we be accepting instructions from, from lenders? What's the position if we accept instructions from lenders, having read their instructions, and then find out we can't provide the documentation that the lender is asking for? My first boss used to say to me that with regard to conveyancing, one of the tricks was to spot a problem, to spot a nightmare right at the start when you're onboarding the client and immediately say to yourself, does this look like trouble? Because it's easy to sort of jettison the client before the transaction starts. As we all know, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to jettison a client midway through the transaction. And if we stall or fail because we can't provide information that the lender requires, bet your bottom dollar it'll be you and I that get it in the neck rather than the lender or indeed anyone else. Invariably, when something goes wrong in conveyancing transactions, it's always our fault. So we need to be careful with regard to lenders instructions. And then what about risk? Risk to you as a conveyancer on the basis that if we fail to comply with the appropriate uh, Building Safety Act and regulations, if we are not careful about remediation work or remediation issues and our client buyer takes a hit, with regard to service charge as a consequence, or our seller has paid service charge that he shouldn't have paid, uh, when in fact the position should have been that the, the responsible person, the landlord, should have been responsible for remediation costs, then what happens? Well, again, unfortunately, the finger is pointed at us, isn't it? So uh, I think we need to be careful with that, and also risk to the client too. So a client seller, who has paid service charge honestly and legitimately year on year, uh, what is the position if we find out that in fact there were works that were paid for by the leaseholder in, within service charge that should have been recovered by the landlord against the third party? So is there not some vulnerability there? And what is the position with regard to the conveyancer advising the client about remediation and about recovery of remediation costs and then how does that transmit to a buyer and then of course there's an even bigger picture which we're not even going to begin to think about this morning but it's something that will be important to anyone that's invo involved in the property market what about advising landlords responsible persons management agents management companies about all of this legislation Certainly, if we just look at the landlord certificate, the amount of information that might need to be gathered and gleaned in order for that, that certificate to be produced is extensive. Who's going to deal with that? Who's going to check that the information is correct and accurate? What happens if we get a seller's conveyance or a buyer's conveyancer saying that the information is insufficient? How on earth do we deal with that? So I think that's a story for another day but is yet again a problem that's going to be encountered. And I think the last thing before we go on the slide is costs. You know, we're charging for leasehold work and we've got a whole raft of additional work to do now. So what happens? Do we just take a hit with regard to that and say, well, yeah, it's all part and parcel of the service? I don't think we can. So even if we're brave enough to say, yeah, high rise buildings, we're still open for business. Lenders, yeah, come on, give us instructions. We're happy to act. Even if we do all of that, I think there's an issue with regard to cost. And I think what we've got to do, given the additional work, given the greater risk with regard to this area, we do need to be charging significantly more. I repeat the point that when I'm talking to conveyances, and I talked to conveyances yesterday and on Tuesday on this very point, people were saying to me in their droves, we're just not going to act high-rise buildings, if a client wants to instruct us, sorry, we can't act. We're not even going to think about it until the dust has settled. The problem I have is I don't, I can't tell you when the dust will settle, but that's a different story. Anyway, let's start off with landlord certificates. Required under the regulations are stipulated on slide here. Applicable for residential flats of 11 metres or five storeys in height. As far as the relevant building is concerned, it has to be a building containing two dwellings that are used for residential purposes. And the idea behind the certificate is that information is being produced by the landlord <coughs> concerning charges for building safety works as defined by the regulations and indeed the Building Safety Act. Problems. So, A, I've already touched on one thing. The amount of work that could be required to produce a certificate will be extensive and expensive. 
The second issue is that if landlords or, uh, or appropriate persons are providing this information, who's advising them and who's assisting them with regard to it? Are we encountering situations where landlords are just simply saying, not relevant, you don't need it, or are they simply saying, we're not going to produce it? More on both of those issues in a moment or two. But certainly I'm seeing positions at the moment where the seller's conveyancer is asking for a landlord certificate at the start of the conveyancing process, or a buyer is asking for it and the seller is then seeking the information and the landlord is either saying not providing it or not relevant or don't know what you're talking about or i want a huge amount of cost given the amount of time and energy i'm going to spend with regard to the production of this thing then we've got two important things that i think are really significant firstly if this information ancillary to the certificate is produced who's going to digest it and advise upon it certainly not us and this is where one of the sort of constant themes of my presentation comes to the fore. We need to be careful to make sure that clients understand what our role is, and we as conveyancers need to understand that too. Remember, our role is to provide information and explanation and to highlight risk, not to assess or determine risk. And that applies within areas that we have sufficient control and, and knowledge. And I would say with regard to fire safety, we don't have knowledge, we don't have extensive um, opportunities to research the law and to assist our clients. All we can do is refer them to specialists, surveyors, valuers, engineers or whatever who can advise on fire safety issues, fire safety measures, uh, where the costs are being met in connection with service charge, then again it's important that someone looks at service charge and assesses where there's remediation work, what's that work relating to and can it be recovered or ought it to be recovered or ought it to be excluded from service charge. So there's issues there straight away. The landlord certificate is required on the transmission of costs into service charge, transmission of costs relating to remedial work. So just because I am a landlord serving service charge accounts or serving charge demands, I don't need a landlord certificate unless my building is more than 11 meters in height or more than five stories and unless the service charge account includes costs that are relevant to remediation the landlord certificate is required when the leaseholder is selling or when a leaseholder requires it and again in those circumstances it is important to understand that as far as a certificate is concerned, it is a certificate as such, but there will be ancillary information that will be produced with it, and it will be necessary for information to be available to the landlord for the certificate to be produced. A question that I haven't found the answer to as yet is what is the position where a landlord is asking for costs with regard to the production of the certificate? And the point there is certainly it would constitute an administration charge which should be subject to a test of reasonableness but i was hoping to find somewhere that there wouldn't be a charge for the production of the certificate i can't find that and therefore my current conclusion is that a landlord is entitled to charge the other point with regard to this is what happens if a landlord doesn't produce a certificate or can't produce a certificate well, evidently there are sanctions as yet to be announced under the 2022 regulations. But in addition to that, and what I can tell you with a degree of certainty, is that the remediation costs that potentially could be transmitted into service charge will be lost as a consequence of an inability or an unwillingness to produce a certificate. The next thing to talk about is the leaseholder's deed of certificate. And again, this is a deed. Uh, why? Because it involves a degree of self-certification and is required to do a number of things. Firstly, to determine whether or not the lease is protected under Schedule 8 of the, of the Building Safety Act 2022. What Schedule 8 does is limit the recovery of remediation costs and cap the recovery of remediation costs as against leaseholders within service charge. It provides a record of ownership and occupation as of the 14th of February 2022 and also is self-certification with regard to the, the issues that the leaseholder might be aware of with regard to remediation issues. 
problems with regard to both of these certificates. Who's liable if the information is correct? Who's going to rely upon it? And what's our role as a conveyancer? Is it simply to act as a mailbox to see that the documentation comes in, provide it to our clients and tell the client that if they have any questions or queries concerning it, they should seek specialist advice? Do we have to provide it to the lender? As far as some lenders are concerned, they'll be relying on us. And herein is the first fundamental problem. Can we comfortably deal with information that's produced in a deed of certificate from a leaseholder or a landlord certificate? My view is we can't. So straight away, I think there's a major problem. Again, if we are willing to accept work in connection with high rise flats or apartments, I think we have to be so careful about scoping the retainer so that we are excluding liability relating to any issues or problems associated with either certificate. Yesterday I was speaking at a webinar and uh, it was KC in attendance, um, a guy called Christopher Heather from Tanfield Chambers, and we were talking about restricted covenants yesterday, but again this issue about scoping the retainer arose, and the important point is that what you've got to do is ensure that clients are aware in this type of situation as to what we're going to do, but also what we're not going to do. And I think a good point to note and to make at this stage is that a number of firms these days with regard to leasehold transactions are producing information sheets to clients concerning issues such as keeping pets, Airbnb letting, etc. And I think this is something, again, that we could be producing an information sheet for clients to say, look, you know, these are the documents that are going to be produced. This is what's likely to be revealed. We can't advise or assist you in connection with it. Therefore, it's necessary for surveyor or valuer to do that, or it's necessary for you to seek specialist advice. The next thing I want to talk about is the Building Safety Act itself and talk about regulation. The Building Safety Act is a wide ranging piece of legislation that requires the building safety regulator, the role of the building safety regulator to act as a sort of an umbrella organization with regards to risks associated with buildings. Higher risk buildings over 18 meters in height or more than seven stories, there are uh, obligations imposed on the responsible person with regard to assessing risk with regard to notifying the regular regulator in circumstances where incidents occur and problems happen, to constantly review risk and to ensure that uh, leaseholders within a building that's an appropriate building are kept informed about what's going on relating to building safety generally, fire safety in particular. It, the Act itself lists what are qualifying leases and for our purposes today, it prevent, prevents the transmission of some remediation costs into service charge due to the application of Schedule 8. What protection is generated? Well, the interesting thing with regard to that is that they are, there are potentially remediation costs that aren't covered by the Building Safety Act, as we'll see. And the other point is that with regard to the protection that's being generated, it is important to understand and appreciate that as far as remediation is concerned, a landlord can be expected to remediate itself out of its own pocket, could be expected to seek contributions to remediation costs from, for those that have been involved in connection with construction work or uh, work in connection with repair, etc., concerning building safety. And it seems to me that the Building Safety Act basically says only where a landlord has explored the recovery of cost for remediation from all possible sources, does the cost ultimately then fall back on leaseholders? There is a cap under the Act with regard to what can be recovered. There is a requirement for remediation costs only to be recoverable within service charge when the appropriate uh, landlord notice has been served, etc., as we've just seen. So, I think as far as the protection is concerned, the Act does create some protection, but it also creates a nightmare too. Flowing on from that, shared ownership leases are a particular problem with regard to the transmission of remediation costs. So do watch out for shared ownership leases. The position is not clear at all as to what the Building Safety Act does with regard to protecting shared ownership leaseholders with regard to remediation costs. 
The Fire Safety Act, again, that I mentioned on the slide here, is interesting. And this is the, uh, the older act that I refer to on the slide here, applying to all multi-occupied residential buildings containing two or more domestic premises and requires responsible persons to assess, manage and reduce fire risk. So the point here is what happens if a responsible person, let's assume the landlord or a management company, identifies that there's a fire risk with regard to a relevant building and re is required in the management of that risk to undertake remediation work. Well, clearly that remediation work could be a cost that could be transmitted into service charge. And again, would that be caught by the Building Safety Act? Well, the answer to that, I think, is yes, but I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. Uh, there's some debate about that, and I've read some debate about that just recently. And then we've got the Fire Safety England regulations, which came in force on the 23rd of January, applicable to all multi-occupied multi multi residential buildings containing two or more domestic premises and which share common parts. So again, we're getting fixated with regard to buildings over 11 metres or over 18 metres, but the fire safety regulations that we mentioned, the 2005 Act, uh, again, can apply to all multi-occupied residential buildings. The Building Safety Act itself defines higher risk buildings as buildings being over 18 metres to which the Act applies and relates to. So, in short, with regard to fire safety, there are regulations that are, will apply to any multi-occupied residential building, no matter what its height. There are additional regulations for buildings over 11 metres or five storeys in height, and additional requirements for buildings over 18 metres or seven storeys in height. And again, the, the issue here that someone said to me yesterday is, well, all right, who's going to actually measure and confirm that this building is over 11 metres or over five storeys? What happens if there's a problem? What happens if, for example, there are seven storeys, 10 storeys, 11 storeys in connection with a building, but two of which are underground? Well, then in those circumstances, we've got a building that potentially is more than seven storeys in height, but is less than 18 metres in height. It's this sort of thing, again, that would require clarification. In the notes, I set out the regulations and, again, responsible person has duties and obligations with regard to fire doors in connection with all properties, the doors to flats and departments in some circumstances, uh, evacuation lifts, and then when we get into buildings that are over 18 meters or seven stories in height, there's all sorts of additional obligations. Now, questions. Number one, what happens if our responsible person doesn't comply with the act? Well, in those circumstances, again, could that lead to an, in, an invalidation of the insurance? Could that lead to potentially leaseholders taking action in connection with compliance? I think the answer to that point is yes. Would that mean that the building safety regulator can intervene and impose sanctions with regard to the responsible person and or landlord? Answer yes. But the regulation fire safety uh, the, the, sorry, the Fire Safety England regulations create a whole new sort of level of responsibility relating to fire safety on the responsible person. Now here I think what, what I can say safely is that we should just simply be telling clients about the existence of the regulations and highlighting to clients what the responsible person should be doing. Unfortunately what we've got is a government information sheet <coughs> that I think we can pass to any leasehold client that's acquiring a leasehold flat. And what I would do, to be honest, is just say, we're going to provide this to everyone and anyone that's buying a leasehold flat or apartment who instructs us. The next thing is the Fire Safety England Regulations 2022. And again, the position here, I would say, is who's going to check the regulations are being complied with? What's the position with regard to non-compliance? Is it going to invalidate insurance cover? And what about breaches and sanctions, et cetera? It's all well and good saying clients, uh, leaseholders are entitled to ensure that the regulations are complied with and can take action in the event of non-compliance, but is a leaseholder really gonna have an appetite to do that? And again, what's our role? Where we've got a situation where we are aware from either the landlord, managing agent, the seller, or our buyer, client, or surveyor or valuer that the regulations haven't been complied with, well, what do we do? 
Again, the important point here is to make sure that clients are aware we're providing information, explanation, but we're not giving any advice relating to it or to the issues. I want to talk about surveys and valuations now. And there is an RICS professional standard for valuation that was amended as of the 6th of December 2022. Now, here I'm a bit concerned, to be honest with you, because if I was being cynical, I might be saying to you, it seems to me there's been a stitch up. Government is worried about fire safety measures and costs and concerned, quite rightly, about fire safety and buildings being dangerous and being aware that landlords are unwilling or unable to meet remediation costs. So what does the government do? It creates funds that facilitate those costs in circumstances where the landlord can't meet them in an effort to make sure buildings are made safe, in an effort to ensure that leaseholders are not carrying the entirety of the burden. So that's the first thing that the government seems to be interested in and seems to resolve and sort out. The second thing is, well, what happens with regard to surveyors and valuers that are undertaking surveys and valuations of these buildings? Given the fact that there are additional layers of fire safety, given there are additional issues with regard to should a landlord remediate, what is remediation, where can a landlord recover remediation costs, what's the role of the surveyor in that sort of mix? And in, again, again, important to understand that as far as remediation schemes, there are a number which we'll touch on in a moment or two. So I think there's a sort of bit of a stitch up between surveyors, RICS government, and also lenders on the basis that to an extent lenders have in the past said because of the problems with regard to fire safety, because of uh, service charge costs, because of uh, an inability to assess what service charge will be going forward, given that remediation work is necessary, lenders are just saying we're not lending anymore. So government needs to encourage lending on the basis that without it, leasehold flat owners are in a position where they're going to be unable to sell their flats or apartments. So I think between the three, what we've got is a situation where lenders are being told to lend, lenders are concerned about lending on high-risk buildings, with regard to fire and additional service charge liability and risk. Surveyors are reluctant to do what they need to do with regard to surveying and valuing such properties. So a scheme is arrived at, including the standard for valuation amendment that I mentioned, that enables surveyors to carry out valuation work, lenders to lend, government to be happy with regard to the provision of uh, costing or funding for remediation work. And the problem is that I think we've been forgotten about. So unfortunately, what we're left with is a situation where lenders are scared about lending, but are required to lend. And therefore, let's put uh, in our instructions to lend to our solicitors and conveyances all sorts of requirements to try and protect us. As far as surveyors and valuers are concerned, they do a deal with lenders with regard to what lenders require from surveyors or valuers. And surveyors or valuers are not fire experts and not remediation experts or construction experts so to an extent they're unable to assist us with regard to our um, considerations and our advising clients etc and therefore we've got a problem so what can we do i think what we do at the moment is limit our retainer to exclude explanation or information concerning fire safety issues that are generated by survey or valuation and we also explain to clients that surveys or valuations may not provide sufficient information to our buyer client to enable our client to assess or determine risk with regard to remediation costs being ultimately transmitted into service charge. On the issue of surveys and valuations, generally, we are obliged to read surveys and valuations that cross our desks. But of course, we're only required to give advice to our clients in connection with issues associated with title. And clearly, fire safety issues, remediation cost, remediation schemes, re remediation recovery would not be within our existing brief. But I think it's important, given that what is now happening relating to building safety and fire safety, that we set out that quite clearly for clients. Before I leave this slide, again, something that I'm constantly droning on about, and I apologise, it essential with regard to where we are deciding that we're happy to act for a buyer who is taking a lease, lease of a higher risk building, uh, out, uh, class that as 11 stories or more, um, in addition, sorry, yeah, 11 stories, uh, seven stories or 
so I'll say that again, 11 meters or 18 meters in height or more, I would be saying to my client, you need to get the best survey you can possibly afford. You need to be asking the surveyor or valuer to advise on fire safety measures, to advise on whether there's any evidence or information forthcoming from landlord or seller with regard to remediation and remediation costs and where a surveyor or valuer is unable to advise or assist on that issue the client should be told to seek specialist advice i'm worried that we we're sort of the fall guys for all of this and i'm worried that because we are not um sorry we're at the the coal face as it were with regard to the client there's a danger that we just say well you know it's too complex it's too much of an issue the landlord's not producing the information the seller can't produce it we'll just proceed on the basis that we've got a client bleating and crying on the basis that we're being awkward and we're being unprofessional in not allowing them to buy the house or the flat or the apartment of their dreams okay the situation with regard to lenders is quite interesting. And again, I mentioned this in the notes. Um, if lenders are protected against remedial costs and issues associated with those costs, then lenders will lend. And it seems to me that lenders are concerned about two things. First of all, the market and demand for flats or apartments, given the concern, the human concern, at risk to life and limb as a consequence of inadequate fire safety. But lenders are also issued in, in about are also concerned about pounds, shillings, and pence. In other words, if they lend on, on, on leasehold property and they have to repossess leasehold property, are they going to be able to sell it? And where there are rem, uh, historical remediation costs that could be transmitted into service charge, what is the position with regard to that? I suppose in addition to that, where a lender is in possession, there's also an issue about current service charge costs that they're going to be liable to meet. What I would say is I have yet to see a lender's instructions that is satisfactory and reasonable with regard to the obligations that are being imposed on the conveyancer or solicitor that's been instructed to act on their behalf. So at the moment what I see is all sorts of unreasonable demands, some demands for information that isn't forthcoming or is not required to be forthcoming because parts of the Building Safety Act and not in force yet. Others, lenders, um, asking for information that is potentially unnecessary given the height of the building, etc., and uh, all sorts of other issues too. In the notes, I've given you details about the various remediation schemes that are available. And uh, the developer remediation contract has just been amended as of the first, sorry, 31st of uh, January 2023. There's a pilot scheme for medium rise buildings, and of course, you'll all be familiar with the Building Safety Fund. Now, the interesting thing here is to, to what extent are we, if we're acting for a seller or a buyer in a leasehold transaction, obliged to dig and delve to determine what's happening with regard to a landlord in connection with an application to a remediation scheme. In an ideal world, the landlord or responsible person will be on the ball with regard to remediation will have put in place the appropriate application for remediation funding and will be able to provide evidence in that connection. Where a landlord has been unable or unwilling to do so, there are measures that can be taken by leaseholders in order to compel the landlord to seek remediation. More on that in a moment or two. But certainly it is important to understand and appreciate that there are three schemes as far as those schemes are concerned, particularly the developer remediation contract scheme, it is very complex. And therefore, you know, to an extent, I have some sympathy with landlords with regard to applying for the scheme. They're certainly not going to have a quick answer and be able to uh, move swiftly where remediation hasn't been sought as yet, where remediation is required and where one of the schemes is called upon. The next thing I want to talk about is the new LPE1. And the requirement here for production of leaseholder deed of certificate, landlord certificate, etc., and details of enforcement action. Yet again, we've got a situation where it sounds fine that uh, the LPE1 from the landlord is required to contain all of this information, but there's a great deal of work that needs to be done relating to it. 
particularly with regard to enforcement action, the amount of documentation that might need to be produced to satisfy a buyer as to what's being done relating to enforcement could be quite draconian. And what's the position with regard to errors? I haven't seen in all my years a situation where a landlord in replies to landlords' inquiries has deliberately lied or been negligent with regard to the production of information and uh, the buyer or indeed seller claiming loss as a consequence on the basis of misrepresentation. Now, I can say that if a landlord were to deliberately lie about remediation costs, etc., or lie about anything deliberately in connection with an LPE1, then he or she would commit an offence under the Fraud Act 2006, uh, which could lead to imprisonment, theoretically. But as far as that's concerned, that's not of solace where a buyer has bought the, a property on the strength of information provided by a landlord only to find that that information is incorrect and that the buyer client is now hit with a service charge cost due to an exhaustion of the re remediation steps and the recovery courtesy of the schemes that we mentioned in the previous slide. Transactional issues then, let's just have a look at this for a minute or two and let's just decide some questions. Question number one, should we act for a seller or buyer of a high-rise flat or apartment in the current market and given what we've currently got? I think you're incredibly brave if you're willing to act for a buyer, uh, particularly where there is an institutional lender involved. If you're acting for a seller, I think you've got to be very careful to make sure that landlord's certificate, leaseholder's deed of certificate, uh, to hand or the information necessary for the production is available to the relevant party. I think we should be really careful about scoping the retainer to exclude liability. We should be warning clients about delays. We should be warning clients about what happens if uh, a transaction stalls or has to be aborted because information that's promised isn't forthcoming or information that is produced is unsatisfactory or inadequate. So when we're acting for a seller, can we get the documentation? I think there's another issue. What about previous remediation? So what's the, what's the situation where the seller has paid service charge and the landlord has not uh, sought remediation from any fund or third party source and there's not attempted redress against develop uh, against contractors etc that potentially could be liable so in those circumstances if there has been previous remediation should a seller be advised to check to see what's been paid in previous service charge years to see if it's possible to seek recovery of payments that have been made that should not have been made that becomes a very, very interesting question. So acting for a seller, alarm bells ring. Acting for a buyer, alarm bells aren't ringing. It's just a situation of the, where we've got an institutional lender involved. I think the risk is too great. If we're acting for a cash buyer, I think we have to be so careful about the retainer. As I say, fortunately, the courts are for saying, professional indemnity insurers are saying that as a transactional property lawyer, we're not expected to be an expert in all fields. We are simply required to highlight or provide our client with information, to where necessary, provide our client with explanation and to highlight risk or give advice on the basis that there is risk. Again, impossible to determine the full extent of what that risk could be with regard to remediation and remediation costs. And therefore, I think what we have to do is just set out to the client the information that's currently available about building safety, the information that's currently available about responsible persons liability relating to fire safety. I think it is important that clients understand and appreciate where a landlord certificate or leaseholders uh, deed of certificate to produce what they do and to what extent a buyer can rely upon them. And I think it's important that we highlight to buyer clients risk associated with service charge going forward. Remember the um, CQS, remember the SRA guidance with regard to leasehold and about the idea of pr providing clients with the bigger picture about leasehold ownership. 
what we're talking about in connection with building safety and I think fire safety falls within that sort of ambit or remit. And I think what's important to do is when we're onboarding a client who's acquiring a leasehold flat or apartment, we need to provide the client with information about their potential vulnerability. Now, with regard to service charge, of course, the first point is your client is committing to an unascertainable expense or liability going forward in any event. Because just because a landlord has advised as to what service charge is likely to be on a new bill, or where three years service charge accounts are produced in connection with an assignment of an old lease, there's no guarantee that that will be a fair indicator of what service charge will be going forward. Further, the obligation for service charge to be reasonable cost, re uh, work undertaken to a reasonable standard, etc., cetera, um, is not necessarily going to provide proper protection for the client. There could be extensive and expensive works that need to be done, but the landlord has behaved reasonably with regard to those works, in which case the leaseholder would be liable for payment. And of course, the consultation process and the cap relating to costs where consultation is not properly adhered to provides some protection, but it doesn't provide total protection. And therefore, I think clients need to be aware of that issue. So we've got the general service charge risk issue. We've got particular issues with regard to higher risk buildings where there's any indication that remediation works have been done or where remediation works are necessary going forward. What should the retainer deal with? It's all well and good me saying limit the scope of your retainer. We need to reduce or limit potential liability relating to the Building Safety Act and relating to fire safety. To that end, we highlight what we're going to do. So yes, Mr. Clark, we're going to see if the seller has uh, a, obtained a, a, a leasehold deed of certificate. We're going to have a look at the, or prov have provided for us a landlord certificate. You're going to have a survey or valuation done. We're recommending to you that you should get expert advice where there are remedial works and remediation costs but we're not going to be able to advise you about that. We're not experts in connection with fire safety. We're not experts in connection with construction. We're not experts with regard to sort of uh, forensic accounting, looking at service charge accounts in the past to see if monies have been paid out that shouldn't be. So I think this point about highlighting work that won't be done becomes so important and making it quite clear what's not going to be done. The other point here, which was something that was drawn to my attention yesterday, which to be honest, I'm aware of, but I think it would require sort of reinforcing this morning. Where we set out at the beginning with good intentions and listen to what I've said and make sure that our retainer is crystal clear as to what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. There is a danger as the transaction progresses when we're shortly to exchange contracts where clients have spent a lot of money on survey and valuation, searches, et cetera, and we identify that there's a problem or an issue. So there's an issue with regard to remediation works or what uh, funding is being sought by a landlord. Uh, and there's a danger that we're asked to seek information or an expert that our client has instructed has asked us to see what information the seller landlord or responsible person has and we then make inquiries about that it's important that in those circumstances we may well be going beyond the scope of the retainer that we originally set and in those circumstances i think it's important again to say to the client i'm doing this work but i'm not doing this work on the basis that i'm going to be able to provide you any advice once the work is concluded i'm obtaining information to go to x for x to be able to give you the appropriate advice I think we need to be very careful about making sure that we manage the retainer as well as scoping the retainer when we first get instructions. I want to talk now about remediation and remediation orders. And first of all, to tell you that it's about to call Katie Gray at Tanfield Chambers, who's writing a report in Property Law UK in the February edition on the first case in this scenario where um leaseholders have brought an action against landlords in connection with a landlord that's failed to remediate properly uh, application to tribunal for a mediation order made to compel a landlord to carry out works landlords or other interested parties can seek remediation contribution orders now this isn't just a landlord seeking a contribution from leaseholders 
but where leaseholders are being required to meet remediation costs within service charge, they can apply to tribunal for the tribunal to order that someone else should be paying those costs. So remediation and remediation contribution orders are interesting. It is litigation, it's first tier tribunal application, but it's litigation and I'm not for the life of me saying as a transactional property lawyer, you should be au okay fait with this and able to advise clients about the process and procedure and assist clients in the process. Again, this comes with a health warning. I think you'd need to instruct a property litigator or counsel that is familiar with these types of application. But given the problem with regard to remediation, given the problems with regard to fire safety and legislation, I can see a huge market potentially for remediation orders being sought by leaseholders who are unable to sell flats or apartments or where transactions are stalling because of problems with regard to the provision of information or remediation work being done or remediation costs being identifiable. I can also see situations where leaseholders, responsible persons, landlords and others are seeking remediation contribution orders from, for, from third parties. So I think we need to tell clients about the, the availability of remediation orders and the jurisdiction of first tier tribunal in that regard. I don't think we have to provide a 12 page essay on the topic. I think it's just important that clients are aware, just as they ought to be aware that they can challenge service charge, that there is a special regime with regard to remediation costs that's available to them. In the notes I mentioned about high risk and acting for lenders, I think it's so important to check instructions. And what I would say is that I would have a system or process within the firm that where a firma is thinking about acting in connection with high-rise flats or apartments um, that are subject to the Building Safety Act and subject to the regulations that we just explored a little earlier, I would want someone else in the firm just to have a look and just agree that it's safe to proceed. I repeat the point that I'm talking to lots of firms who are just saying institutional lenders and high-risk buildings and Building Safety Act liability does not mix and therefore we're not getting involved. Check your instructions. Remember you're under an obligation to review your instructions before you exchange contracts. That's an entirely different can of worms that you can envisage. So what happens if a lender changes instructions mid-transaction? And I made this point earlier, I repeat it again. What happens if we can't comply with our instructions? So a problem arises that the lender requires documentation. We seek it. The seller says they'll get it, the landlord says it's uh, available, and then all of a sudden we find out that isn't the case. That becomes a major problem. Conclusions then for today. Conclusion number one. As far as information is concerned, in the notes I tell you some of the resources that are available. The Leasehold Advisory Service has some information about fire safety and the Building Safety Act. Armour has some information about the new landlord's inquiries. The Leasehold Knowledge Partnership, which to be honest with you, was um, a resource, it's a charity, that I thought would really sort of grab this tiger by the tail and resolve it and deal with it, hasn't done so as yet. And I was looking at their news page this morning in the hope that there would be something on there that might shed some further light about some of the issues and unknowns that we've discussed this morning but there isn't as far as the law society is concerned again it would be brilliant if we could see some guidance or a practice note from them with regard to the, some of the problems that we've talked about and better that they sort of clarify with lenders about the standard set of instructions for leasehold lawyers dealing with leasehold transactions that would be brilliant are there ongoing problems? Bet your life there is. Building Safety Act still not completely in force. The role of the building safety regulator sounds fantastic when you look at the act and look at what it's what the regulator is what the body is designed to do, but what will it actually do? As far as leasehold transactions, which were complex and a bit of a mess for a variety of reasons, escalating ground rents, all that goes with it, we've seen in the past, are in a bigger mess. Important to understand that yes, there are issues relating to high rise flats and apartments, higher risk buildings as the Building Safety Act would prescribe, but there are also issues relating to fire safety in connection with all flats and apartments where there are two or more flats in a building or development. So it's not just 
high rise flats that are an issue. I am seeing situations where conveyances at the moment <coughs> are asking for landlord certificates, leaseholders deed of certificate in connection with transa uh, transactions and properties that don't require them. I am seeing landlords saying such documentation aren't, isn't necessary, where clearly it is. I'm seeing situations where landlords are genuinely trying to assist with regard to the provision of information, but having difficulty in producing that information in a timely manner. And I'm seeing conveyances that are just sort of putting their head in their hands with regard to all the problems that I've explored or discussed. So what do I suggest you do? Uh, have a look at the information that I referred to in the notes. Um, do have a look at the leasehold advisory services guidance in connection with fire safety. As far as the Building Safety Act is concerned, there's a lot more that you might be interested in. I did a presentation last year on the Building Safety Act. I'm going to have a look at that and rejig some information relating to it when I've got time. I've also produced um, with uh, a lady called Zara Olobogis, uh, some uh, an information sheet in connection with what we've been talking about today, a sort of flowchart and diagrams, etc., which I'm happy to give to Stephen and Robert to, for distribution for delegates today. I repeat that the Property Law UK publication in February is going to look at a lot of these issues in a lot more detail. So if anyone's interested in that, if you let either Stephen or Robert or myself know, we can make sure that you get the appropriate link. And what I want to do, because I'm conscious that it's nearly 12, Stephen, is first of all, say thank you, Stephen, for inviting me along today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm sorry I can't produce, I like rabbits out of the hat, solutions and give you a magic checklist and say, there you go, comply with that and your Law Society Conveyancing Handbook compliant and your professional indemnity insurers will love you and you're able to open the doors again to leasehold clients, both sellers and buyers for in connection with high-rise flats and departments and you're able to advise landlords, responsible persons, management companies and everyone else. Unfortunately, I can't do that. All I can do today is warn you about some of the issues, come up with what I think is quite a defensive position to take, but it's a position that I know that conveyances are taking. So, Stephen, thank you very much indeed for inviting me along today. I think you've got another uh, series of polls, have you, or something else to have a look at before we finish? Uh, I have, Ian, but I think given the time, we, we won't um, run that poll today. Um, I just want to say, we usually at this point, we would run a Q&A, uh, unsurprisingly, given the, uh, the topic and how relevant it is right now and the number of people we have online. We've had over 50 questions, mm -hmm. Ian, so yeah. um, what we're going to do is um Ian maybe not be too happy about this i'm going to put Ian to work after this webinar and uh, hopefully reply to as many of these as we can mm -hmm. thank you to everyone that has submitted a question and to everyone uh, yeah. for joining us today and also i just want to apologize for for the, the start and i appreciate there have been some people throughout that have had some sound issues i do think that it's something to do with the sheer volume of people we've had today and we really do appreciate right. everyone coming along um, just before we log off, I just want to remind everyone that, uh, as I said at the start, you can find our previous courses and a lot of the talks that Ian have, has done on our YouTube channel. The link is uh, in the chat section of the, um, the the control panel, so please do check that out. Once you leave today's webinar, there is a short survey, and I appreciate these are a pain to fill out, but please, if you would take 30 seconds to a minute to fill it out, it will definitely help us. Uh, to improve future presentations, but also uh, in terms of Stuart title and IQ legal training, our own products and services. So th it does take between 30 seconds and a minute to fill that out. Uh, you'll also mm -hmm. receive um, an automated message from GoToWebinar. Um, if you respond to that email, you can also ask questions to myself and Ian via that. So the replies will come directly to me and I can send any questions or feedback on to Ian. And in the coming days, there will also be an email going out from my colleague Robert Kelly, which will contain the slides and the notes for today's section, uh, session, as well as a recording of the session as well. I think that's everything I wanted to say. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say to wrap up, Ian. No, just thank you for, for Stuart Title, yourself, Stephen, and Robert for organising today. Um, I was just talking to someone yesterday, and my father used to say to me when I boy really that as far as business was concerned he always used to do business with people not organizations and i have to say the people at stuart title are 
lovely people to deal with and do business with, very helpful, very um, keen to assist the legal profession, both with regard to product and organizing events such as this. But in addition to being very nice people, they're a good company to work with, good company with good products. So if you do get the chance, have a look at Stuart Title's website, have a look at what they're doing. And I've put on a slide here that Robert, who I think is business development manager, Stephen, is on the right in that official title. That's correct, yes, commercial business yeah. development manager. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's available and you're available as well, Stephen, to discuss the needs and requirements of anyone that's attended today. Absolutely. That's right. Great. All right. Thanks Thank for coming you. along. Thanks. To everyone, take care now. Bye bye.